Morning, church. Morning. 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 I think one of the uh, most stressful jobs in church is working on the back desk. Do you find that there, Cooper? So much going on. Buttons to press, knobs to turn, pull, to get them all done in the right order and at the right time. And if we don't, we turn around and stare at them. Thanks, guys. We appreciate what you're doing back there. Right. Last week, we started in 2 Thessalonians, didn't we? So we'll be somewhere around there this morning again. But as we start, before I share any scripture with you, I want you to, I want you to think a little bit about a way in which God has been good to you. Have you got something in your head? Something that you would say is a token of God's goodness in your life. Something that happened this week. You've got a picture of what that is? Do you, Mike? All right, what is it? One sentence, very short, Mike. Nice and loud. How has God been good to you? I'm putting you on the spot, I know. You know it's coming, right? You know it's coming. You You all thought of something, something, I know you did. did. What was was that? that? So So how how has God God been good good to you? you? Very quickly. quickly. One One sentence, sentence. no No stories, stories. just Just a few few words. words. How How has God God been good good to you? you? Yes, Tim. All right, my wife's health's improving. Awesome, thank you. What else? One sentence, yes. No pain this week. Amen. Hallelujah for that, right? Okay. What, 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 what other ways do you count as God's goodness? Sue? All right. Good. Rod, we appreciate that. Praise the Lord. Karen? Energy to get through work. Energy to get through work. Yes. All right. What else? Just doesn't have to be anything uh, spectacular, but just ways in which you're grateful to God. Moria? A roof over your head. Not to be taken for granted, eh? Yep. Any other things? Food on the table. Food on the table. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. What else? Sorry, what was that, Jonathan? <laughs> you set him free, did you? Yeah, I heard something over there. Yes, made it to another Sabbath, right? What's so awesome about the Sabbath? It's a foretaste, isn't it? It's a taste of the world to come. Absolutely. Okay, what else? Blessing and prospering in general. Yep. Merv? Family. Yes, all right. Awesome blessing. Anything else? From traveling? Yes, not to be taken for granted either, is it? All good blessings, all the things. Yes, Kerry? The rain. Who's thankful for that on a long weekend? (laughs) Not sure about that one, Kerry. No, I hear what you're saying. We are grateful for the rain, right? Especially when it dries out. Absolutely. Yes, Sue, again. All right, answered prayers. Absolutely. Yep. All right. The point of this little exercise that I'm doing with you this morning is that we're told in Scripture to give thanks to the Lord. Now, I know there's many greater things we can give thanks to the Lord for, right? I mean, you could have gone deep. You could have gone, you could have said, I'm I'm grateful that the Lord came 2,000 years ago, that He was incarnated, that He became man, that He lived the life that He lived, that He died on the cross. You could have said, you could have said, I'm grateful that we have a heavenly intercessor in the sanctuary right now representing us to God. All of those things would be true as well, right? Whether on the on the scale of of out of this world amazing or the everyday blessings to cultivate that attitude of gratitude is encouraged in Scripture, to rejoice in all circumstances, to give praise to God for the good things that He's done. This is, as Christians, to live in that awareness that God is a part of our everyday life. He's not just high up on the throne, far away in a place called heaven, waiting to come and fetch us one day, but that even today, every blessing you and I receive is as an extension of the gift of the cross. Have you thought of the food on your table as that? You know, that's actually kind of why we pause. Many of us pause before we eat. And if you haven't paused before you eat to pray, that's okay. That doesn't make you a sinner. All right? 
Sometimes we have these traditions that form around us and then we feel like we have sinned if we don't uphold the tradition. It's merely a tradition, but there is a good, there is a good significance to the tradition because as Christians we recognize that life as we experience it here on earth, even the unbeliever is the recipient of the grace of God. And you're thinking, how is that? I understand that Christians are the recipients of the grace of God. They've been reconciled. They've been forgiven. They've been given the hope of eternal life. I totally get how we should be thankful for the cross of Christ. But the unbeliever, how is the unbeliever a recipient of the grace of God? Very simply that the cross is the very reason why the unbeliever has a chance to live as an unbeliever. The cross has purchased the right to life for every human being. The only difference between the believer, well, there's many differences, but the only difference for the purpose of this illustration between the believer and the unbeliever is that the believer, by their alliance with Christ and their choice to become a part of his family, the believer gets to keep on living for all of eternity. But if the cross hadn't happened, if, if forgiveness for the world hadn't been granted... What does Scripture say? For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast, right? In another place, John 3 verse 16, it says, how many were included in the gift? For God so loved the believing world. No. For God so loved the the world in its fallen state, in its rebellious state. Romans chapter 5 says, For while we were yet sinners, while we were still at war with God, while we were still separated from God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He included the fallen in His gift. He wasn't coming to redeem those who somehow were not in favor of the fall, who somehow were keeping themselves nice and holy away from the world, biding their time. No, no, no. Christ came into the world for the entirety of the world, the lost, even the lost who will one day be lost forever. He died for them. You see, the point is this, that every day of life you have is because of the cross. Not just your forgiveness. Not just your grand salvation. Not just that we have an intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary. Not just that we have a Savior who's returning face to face to take us to be with Him forever. Not just for those grand things, but every gift you have is a gift from God. Is the result of the cross. Because the cross covered the world in the grace of God. Without the cross, what was promised to Adam and Eve would have been the fruit of their rebellion. In the day you eat thereof, God said to them, what will happen? You will surely die in the day you eat of it. But they didn't die in that 24-hour period. Why? Because the moment they fell, Jesus took them and he introduced the sacrificial system. A lamb died. He clothed them in the skin of the lamb, covered their nakedness that they had tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. He covered their nakedness, and therefore they didn't die because something else died in their place that day. That something pointed forward to what he would do when he came as man to die in their place as the real sacrifice, the true sacrifice. In the day they Eight of that fruit, something died. And the only reason it wasn't them was because Jesus said, I will take their sin. So, understand this. Before they came back to God, before they asked for terms of peace, before they wanted reconciliation, before they showed any inclination, while they were still hiding in the bush, running from God, He sought them out with a plan. He came to them with a constructive solution. He came to be their sacrifice. So every day that you have is a gift from God. The point of why I'm highlighting this is because I think that as Christians, we are perhaps obviously, logically enamored with the deeply spiritual. We get how that's connected to God. You know, the cross, you know, the ascension, you know, what he's doing in the heavenly sanctuary, you know, when he comes back again. Like, like, obviously, that's all spiritual, right? That's all very clearly, I don't want to say the word, but religious. 
terrible word because it carries too much baggage in the, in the wrong kinds of ways. But it's, it's spiritual in nature. So we get how when we talk about spiritual things, well, obviously that's spiritual. But many of us, despite the fact that we might be spiritually minded, we might believe in spiritual things, we believe in salvation, we might not always live every moment of our day in gratefulness to the God who has given us the mundane blessings. Now, there's actually nothing mundane about the blessings you mentioned, but I'm using the word mundane in comparison with the deeply spiritual. Does that make sense? The everyday things. They are the gift of the cross. They are the reason, they are the token of the presence of God in our everyday life. The Thessalonian church was a group of believers who were struggling in their everyday life. In fact, when you read the first chapter of chapter 2, and you'll find it in other places, of course, it kind of weaves its way all the way through their narrative. If the, the, the one thing the Thessalonian church did not have was an easy life. To be a believer in this time in earth's history, the time in which the scriptures were written, the time in which the Thessalonians and the Galatians and the Ephesians and Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and all of them lived... In that first 100 years, the vast majority of your life as a Christian would probably be spent trying to avoid incarceration, prison, punishment and torture, possibly even death itself, because Christianity was seen as being hostile to the Roman government. It was an illegal religion in its early days. Judaism had some favor and had some understanding, but Christianity wasn't always, wasn't always, uh, wasn't always seen that way. In some ways, sometimes it was and sometimes it, uh, it wasn't. But the thing about Christians is just like the Jews, they were monotheistic. They wouldn't, they wouldn't worship everything else. And, and so they wouldn't burn incense to the, to the Caesar. And of course, you did that to acknowledge that it wasn't just the burning of a sweet-smelling fragrance. It was that you were acknowledging it was an offering to the gods. It was the acknowledgement that, that the Caesar was the incarnation of the deity. But they believed who was the incarnation of the deity? Jesus. Jesus was the true incarnation of the deity. And so the Thessalonian believers, they were in trouble. They didn't have all the everyday blessings that you and I take for granted which is why I wanted you to name them. I wanted you to list them. I hope you're still thinking of more of them because everything that happens to you, every blessing you have in this life is the result of the cross because without the cross, there is no life, period. In the day they eat of it, they will surely die. The believer is the recipient of the grace of God, even in their unbelief and in their rebellion. They are the recipient of the grace of God. The very thing they don't, the very person they don't want anything to do with is the reason they have the life to shake their fist at the God who gave it to them. He has purchased their earthly life. He has also purchased their eternal life, the same as he has done for you. The Thessalonians came up in a time where they didn't dare take the everyday blessings of God for granted. Because one day you had life and the next day you didn't. The one day you had freedom and the next day you didn't. There was no human rights charter that you could appeal to. There was no United Nations that you could appeal to. There was no, there was no international community that most of the time would turn a blind eye but sometimes would act. There wasn't any of that. So Paul says... Paul says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, verse 3, as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Now, 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 now listen to these words in the context I've tried to create in your minds. A hostile environment, an uncertain environment, a dangerous environment. I want you to listen to what's happening to the believers We give thanks to God for you because your faith is greatly enlarged. And the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and your faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. And then he goes on to present hope. 
He goes on to describe the coming of the Lord. He goes on to say, it won't last forever. So don't let your circumstances dictate your outlook on life. Live for the fact that victory is coming. Live for the fact that God will intervene. Live for the fact that although you seem to have to wait now in this time of in-between, live as one who knows the victory is already his. And if the victory is already his, then you can focus on growing that faith in God. You can focus on loving the believers. Chapter 2, we kind of covered most of last week, so I'm going to jump down to verse 13. It says here, But we should always give thanks to God for you. Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. These were people who knew the fellowship of the Spirit. They knew what it was like to walk in the power of the Spirit, and they clung to the truth of God's Word, and that's what sanctified them. The presence of the Holy Spirit, their belief in the Word of God, shaped and molded, set them apart, made them different to the world around them. The world hated them for it, but God applauded them for it. They had hope because they walked with the Savior. It was for this that He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, brethren, stand firm, hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. May Lord Jesus Christ himself, God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. And then when you carry on reading in chapter 3, there's at least two verses there I'd love for you to memorize. When I was reading this a few few days ago, I I got stuck on these verses, verses 3 and verse 5. And you know, sometimes when you're reading in Scripture and you go, the way that's said, the significance of it, I have to store it, I have to lock it down. Not just read it, but memorize it. Here's the verse, verse 3. The Lord is faithful. I reckon that whatever follows after that sentence is a good one. The Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. That's one of them that I memorized. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Now I want you to remember who he's saying this to. This isn't some academic promise or some academic um, uh, uh, discussion. He's talking to a group of people whose lives are in danger. He's talking to a group of people who have hardship, trial, difficulty, who are not supported by a a work and income and a social network. He's talking to a group of people who are, are misunderstood and persecuted. He's talking to this group of people and he says, number one, everything that happens, even the junk that comes your way, I want you to begin your thought process like this. But the Lord is faithful. Now, I've got a question for you. Do you, think that they, do you think that they miraculously escaped all form of punishment? That nothing bad ever happened to them? That they didn't sustain loss or pain or suffering? No. And yet he still says, hold on to this fact in the midst of it all. The Lord is faithful. He's going to do two things for you. He's He's going going to protect protect you, you. and He's going to strengthen you. Now, why do you think you might need strengthening? Because we are weak. Because you've come up against a bigger bully. Because you're in trouble. Because you're experiencing pain, suffering, difficulty, unanswered questions, torture, whatever it is. So on the one hand, the Lord is faithful. He will protect you. And many times you have been protected. But know this, that know this, that on the occasion where the enemy is permitted in some way, for whatever reason, to break through the defenses of the Lord, you are not left alone in that time, as your circumstances might suggest you are. But the Lord is faithful. He will protect you, but he's also going to do something else. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to strengthen you. So that whatever comes into your space, whatever comes into your life, you will endure. You will survive. Well, if you read the story of the people in Scripture, if you read the story of the Thessalonians, we might even change that word from survive. 
which is kind of a, you're just going to get by by the skin of your teeth, right? We could change that to thrive. Because if I take you back to verse 3, this is not the story of someone who's merely hanging on by the skin of their teeth. I mean, listen to this. We give thanks to God because of you, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. That does not sound like the story of survivors who did whatever they needed to do to survive. That sounds like the story of thrivers. People who against all odds, because they've been shaped by the Word of God, because they've been filled by the Holy Spirit, not because they had an easy life, not because they were born into the right family, not because they had a great education, not because of any of that stuff that we look at today and go, well, if a person has this, this, and this in their life, they're bound to thrive. No. They thrived against all odds. They thrived in an environment that most people would not thrive in. Their faith was enlarged. And their love for one another grew. You know, you think of the reality TV shows. Not advocating, of course, that you watch them. But because you do. If you think of your reality TV shows, you'll notice that the harder it gets... The general tendency and what makes great television is that the harder it gets, the more the individuals look out for themselves. They betray, they break alliances, they tell lies, they stab in the back, all so that they can survive to the next round and maybe win. Do you get what I'm trying to say to you? You see, typically in a hostile environment, without the grace of God, without the infilling of the Holy Spirit, without living by the Word of God, the natural tendency of the human nature is to survive by any means necessary. The end justifies the means. But I want you to look at the Thessalonians this morning, and I want you to see a community of faith that doesn't survive in that sense, but they thrive. They're not turning inward upon themselves. They're not looking out for their own interests. But the harder it gets, the greater their faith towards God becomes. And the more they look out for others. That's what it means to love others, right? They're not trying to preserve their own life. And you know why? Because they don't have to. Whether you live long or whether you live short, it actually doesn't matter. This life is only the trial run for the eternal life. See, that's the reality of the Christian mindset. That's the reality. That, now, that doesn't mean we want to die. No, of course not. Everybody wants to live. But, but if we do die, we would rather die than sell out our convictions about God. We would rather die than sell out our bre brothers and sisters. We would, rather, we would rather have our lives cut short. Why? Because we know, actually, life for the believer is not a limited commodity. It is eternal and it is everlasting in the hands of the one who was resurrected to eternal life and gives that gift to us. You see, a Christian doesn't have to preserve his life at all costs. He doesn't have to look out for himself because God has done that for him. So he is free to live for others. Whether it's short or whether it's long, it actually doesn't matter. This is only the beginning of life. The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. And here's the second one, verse 5. And may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. I read that and I thought, that's what I want. That's what I'm going to pray for. That's what, that's what I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to do in my life. Lord God Almighty, direct my heart into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Because in that place, this world can't take anything from you. I mean, they can, but they can't. You know what I'm saying, right? In that place... 
you have found your wholeness and your completeness. And whatever the pain and the loss in this world, it is temporary. Because your security is out of this world. And what the world didn't give, the world cannot take. So I challenge you with this this morning. Wherever you've been planted and whatever your circumstances, whether you've had the best possible start to life, whether chance and, 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 and the randomness of this life has given you that, or whether you've had the worst start to life and you're still trying to pick up the pieces, it doesn't matter. Pray this prayer. Lord, direct my heart into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Whatever your past, whatever your present, whatever your future might be, Lord, direct my heart into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Because in that place, we are complete and we are whole. The Thessalonians didn't just survive. They thrived when all odds were against them because they had the Holy Spirit, the assurance of eternal life. They knew their sins were forgiven. Their Savior had already come and done what needed to be done. Their gift every day, everyday life, everyday blessings, they recognized as tokens of the cross, the gifts of God. They loved Him for it, and they loved Him even more for the fact that they had more than what this world could offer. You know what? What they have is what we have. One difference, for the most part, you and I are living in an environment at this moment in time that wasn't nearly as hostile as that was for them back then. So I ask you, why should you not thrive? If thriving is not about your circumstances, if thriving is not about your education, if thriving is not about how much money you have, if thriving is about your heart being in the love of God and in the steadfastness of Christ, then anyone, anywhere, under any circumstances can thrive in Christ. Despite hardness, despite loss, despite suffering, despite disappointment, despite betrayal, despite hurt, despite the breakdown of relationships, despite all the stuff that happens, despite sickness, despite death itself, you do not need to be content with surviving. Press into God for thriving. Pray this prayer. May the Lord direct my heart into the love of God and in to the steadfastness of Christ. Amen. Grant's chosen us a very appropriate hymn to close with. My faith has found a resting place. Not in a man-made creed, I trust the ever-living one that he for me will plead. We'll stand together as we sing this.